Hey, what's up, everybody? How you feeling? So good to see you all. I want to welcome everybody here in Gahanna. I want to say what's up to everybody in Northwest, everybody watching online. So good to have you here. And uh, man, this is an exciting season. We are coming back to church. And uh, actually, next weekend will be our first weekend fully back in, uh, in our Gahanna campus. And so just excited about what God's doing. Invite you to be a part of it. Last week, I, I uh, kind of put up our kids ministry, our kids team. So many amazing kids and leaders that are back there. And a number of you signed up to be a part of that. You're helping us in the comeback. So I just want to say thank you for that and for being a part of this. My name is Greg, by the way. Uh, my wife Shaylin and I have a few kids and it's a a challenge, but it's great and it's wonderful and, and uh, just excited to be a part of the body of Christ. Thankful to be alive. You, you ever like go through something and it's really hard and every once in a while you go, you know, but I'm alive. <laughs> like I've got, I've got breath in my lungs. You know, I'm not dead. I, I have today as an opportunity and, and uh, I just think it's important that we continue to, to be reminded that God's still on the throne, that God is still doing things even though uh, the world may be in chaos and things are crazy and, and who knows what stat to believe. You know, I saw somebody post today and they were like, you know, uh, I found out that 25% of the 67% of 32% of COVID stats are made up on the spot and, and you have no way of knowing. You know, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy, but it's okay because God's still on the throne. And how many of you know God can work even in the middle of chaos? He can bring clarity that God can work in the middle of that and creating and building us into who he wants us to be. And uh, so anyway, I'm excited. I'm excited to share today's message with you. I was thinking actually on my way in, when I first started preaching, I've been preaching now about 16 years, um, I had to do the math actually on the way in. I'm like, oh, two thousand. I started to do the math. But uh, I remember when I first started preaching, I would have so much anxiety. I would be so nervous about preaching because I was worried I wouldn't do a good job. I, I was worried that I would get up and, you know, mishandle the Bible or, you know, I'd do something wrong and, and um, fail at what I was doing. And then I'm thinking, you know, somebody's there and they, they need to hear this word and it, it needs to be good. And, and, and if, what if I'm not on? What if, what if you know, I, I'm just not very motivating or I'm not, um, you know, engaging or I don't say it in a memorable way. And so I would, I would really put a lot of pressure on myself. And I started to notice this weird thing started happening. There would be some weeks that I would get up and I would preach, and I, and I honestly felt like I did a great job. I'd come away like, man, that was killer, you know. I, I, I think I really crushed it, you know. And, and, and nobody would, like, say anything. And, and then I'd get home to my wife, and I'd be like, hey, honey, you know, how'd I do, you know. And she's like, oh, it's fine, you know, pass the green beans, you know. And it was, it was like, okay, maybe it wasn't as good as I thought. And, you know, and I'd then get a little discouraged. But then I found, like, I, w I would actually then, other weeks I would get up and I would preach and I would feel like it was terrible, like awful. I'd be like, that was so bad, I almost left. <laughs> like I, I almost got up and walked out. I was bored. I was starting to nod off in my own sermon. Like it was not good, it was bad, it didn't make any sense. And then uh, inevitably, like I would get two or three messages from some of you like, man, that was exactly what I needed. Like God really used that in my life. And so I've just come to learn that you know, I, I can say what I'm going to say, but what really matters is what's God saying. What's God saying to you? So here's what I want to I want to do, and, and this will be great because like I could totally botch it up today, like mess it up, and God can still cut right through it if you'll be receptive. Because I believe God's going to talk to you if you'll listen. So let's take a moment and let's just go to Him, Lord. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we open up our hands. In fact, wherever you are. Whatever location, whatever place you might be, just open up your hands like this and just, if you're receptive, in an in in attitude, even a posture of receptivity. God, we're, we're here to receive from you. Lord, we know that there are good things and, and good ideas, but we want God things and God ideas. And I pray, Lord, that you would cut through my humanity. I pray, Lord, that any mistakes I make, Lord, you would, you, you would just sort of blind folks to it, that you would cut right to your word and you would do what only you can do, which is to customize, personalize in a group of people that are literally hearing this all over the place, all over the world. And yet, Lord, you have a way of giving us right what we need when we need it. We thank you. And whatever you say, we receive it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen. Um, a number of years ago, uh, Shaylin and I, my wife and I, went to an event that was, um, we were basically going to be a part of a, a missions organization. It's an organization that our church partners with, 
And we partner with uh, leaders and churches and missionaries all over the world, some local, some global. And so we went to kind of celebrate this organization and to hear the things they were doing. And so we're sitting there and they're sharing story after story. And um, they had a, a young girl that came up to share her story. And she was from a part of the world where there is a massive issue with something called genital mutilation. Um, I had never heard of genital mutilation. I didn't know it was a thing. And as she began to talk about it, she began to inform me and everybody there that in the, this part of the world she's in, they, um, they, they mutilate little girls' genitals. And basically it's part of a procedure that helps to make the sexual experience more pleasurable for the men and the, the, the society. And they do it to young girls. I mean, she was like, I think she was 11 years old when this happened. When I met her, she was about 14, 15 years old. And so she's talking about the horror of this, how horrible it was physically, emotionally, spiritually in every way. And, and um, this organization that, that we work with was able to find her, was able to help her. And she was able to talk about the way she's been able to forgive and then the way God's using it in her life. And she wants to grow up and become a lawyer and go try to fight this thing. And so I'm sitting there listening to this. And I, I just got to tell you, like, I, I have these waves of, like, feelings and emotions that are hitting me. I can still honestly feel it now thinking back because I remember exactly what she looked like. And I remember at first I just felt really, really sad. Like, I just felt crushed for her. Um, then I felt really angry. And I'm like, who does this? Like, this is unbelievable. Like, I wanted to just leave Columbus. I wanted to move to this part of the world and just go silverback gorilla, okay, <laughs> and just fight this. I'm like, this is not right. Like, this is, I, I just, no one should ever have to have this happen. I just felt this, honestly, sort of version of rage. And then I felt a third wave, which was weird. I felt exhausted, and I frankly felt demoralized and discouraged because within the conversation, I became aware of one more horrific thing that was going on in the world, one more injustice. And I went from feeling sad to mad to almost, I'm embarrassed to admit, but I'll tell you, almost demotivated, almost feeling like to do any good in the world felt like trying to boil the ocean, can't do anything. And it just started to feel like then I'm not going to do anything because I don't feel like I can do everything. And I don't know if you felt that before, but I, I felt that in that moment. And I've, I've felt it since then. And uh, I, I went home actually that, that night and I told my wife, I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm frankly discouraged. I feel like I can't do. And so I made a list of everything that I've personally been asked to participate in, in terms of injustices and really valuable, important causes. And I made this list because I'm like, I, I, I just feel like I, I can't do it all. And it was this, um, here was the list. Hunger, clean water, human trafficking, prostitution, racial injustice, genital mutilation, women's rights, child abuse, public health, education, abortion, alcoholism, opiate crisis, animal cruelty, domestic violence, unemployment, special needs children, special needs adults, orphans, age discrimination, religious persecution, and the list goes on. And as I started to kind of try to work my way through, it was like, what do I do? I actually learned of something called compassion fatigue. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's a real, it's a real thing. Compassion fatigue. Um, compassion fatigue is, is a term psychologists use that they actually first began to discover primarily in people that work in the medical uh, healthcare field and people that work in, in, in health professions. And the reason they started to notice this is because these folks work in these environments that puts them in situations where they commonly, like day in and day out, they see or hear about ongoing, sometimes unspeakable suffering. And it's not unusual to see these people, like good-hearted people, like people that get into what they're doing because they want to help people. They get to this place where they actually start to develop this level of exhaustion and sometimes actually lose hope altogether, totally burn out. And then what they found is actually since the information age has been introduced, that it used to be primarily in, in professions where people were facing people's worst day every day. And now they're finding actually that it's hitting everyone because 
Every day, tragedy is instantly broadcast directly on your TV into your house. No matter, no matter what your job or profession, it's, it's coming to your laptop, it's coming to your hand and your smartphone. And so it's no longer now relegated to certain professions. And so we, we have to kind of figure out what are we going to do as the body of Christ what do we do about compassion fatigue? Now, I'm, I, I want to just press pause real quick. We're in a series right now that we're calling Good, Better, Best. And we're talking about how, you know, when you first come to Christ, your, your decisions are between good and bad. You know, it's just like, all right, I want to do good and I don't want to do bad. Do good, don't do bad. Just try to do good and don't do bad. And eventually you start to realize sin is a, is a trap. Sin will rob from you. It will steal. It's not even like, I don't want to sin because I'm worried God will be mad at me. I know God's quick to forgive. He'll give new mercy and new grace. It's not even about appeasing God, although I want to live holy because he is holy. I want to live in that relationship, but it's, it's really like sin will, will, will blind you. Sin will trap you. It will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to be there. So at a certain point, you start to go, you know what? I'm not going to live in sin, but then we have to decide between good things and the best things, good, better, best. So we've been using this, this whole, um, you know, analogy of whack-a-mole. Uh, you remember this game from uh, uh, Chuck E. Cheese days? I'm just, you know, you, you whack the mole. Okay, what? Oh, oh okay, my bad. Uh, got to be patient. I got a little excited there, okay? As soon as you whack a mole, another one pops up. And so we've been talking about how life feels like this. You know, you whack the mole at work and the family pops up and you whack the family mole and, and the finance pops up and you whack the finance mole and the energy pops up and you just never stop whacking moles. And it feels, you know, this is why people get burned out because they go, I, I got to wake up tomorrow and just whack more moles. So I want to pull the covers over my head because I feel like all I did today, you know, I come home to my wife, honey, how was today? Oh, I whacked a bunch of moles. Score 42. And, and we feel like this. And this is why I think sometimes folks lose hope because you go, this is what my life feels like. At a certain point, we have to realize we can't whack all the moles. We, we can't do it all. We have to take our limited resources of our time, energy, and money. Your time, energy, and money, that's you, what you're giving of yourself, and decide what's good, what's better, and what's the best use of me and what's the best use of you. And I think what comes out of it is our, not only our max effectiveness, but we're able to actually enjoy what God's given us. We're able to actually enjoy the things we participate in instead of feeling like we're not doing enough. Have you learned at this point in life that it's really a lot, a lot of times the simple things? It's the journey. It's being able to be generous. It's being able to do something nice for somebody and not feeling like you didn't do enough. It's being able to worship God and not go, oh, but my hands weren't high enough. Oh, I didn't sing out enough. It's being able to give something and go, like, like it, was, it was great. that You gave your best. And not live in that condemnation and that guilt. So what I'm trying to do is really tee up a conversation for you and God where you look and say, am I aiming myself, my time, energy, and money in the most important places? And then live guilt-free because God loves a cheerful giver. All right? We're talking about these three things. The, the first thing we all need to be giving to is God. All right? Whatever you give to first. We give God our first. We give our best to God, and, and we make everything about him. Then next is our circle. We talked last week. You, you can't get close to everybody. You can't be best friends with everybody. You don't want to get to the end of your life, and you just spread yourself so thin that the people that God's put around you, these really important people that, that, that you have that you haven't given your your best to, you know. We want to be able to really make space and time for that. And then we're talking today about community. And I think community, when we talk about giving to your community, is where we have the potential to slide into compassion fatigue because there are so many causes. There are so many important things, and they're all important. There's nothing that I just mentioned that could be crossed off the list. It's all critical. It's got to be done. But how do we do it? All right. Now, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm, I'm going to show you how Jesus overcame compassion fatigue. Okay, we're going to learn right from Jesus. And I'm going to give you a little, um, I'm going to give you a little bonus material today of just some, like, like an overview of how to be a great disciple of Jesus. Okay, if you were to look at the, at the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew gives us a really beautiful picture of how Jesus discipled the disciples and how they learned from him. And so uh, I'm going to give this to you quick to build a foundation for 
the point that's going to be made, all right? Start with this. If, if you have your Bibles and you want to open, follow along, cool. If not, fine. Some of it will be up on the screen or on this beautiful board I have here. Um, also, if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. And if you don't want a paper Bible, you can get the digital version, the Bible app. It's amazing. It has, um, it has reading plans. You can pull it up anytime. It's better than social media, all right, you can read the scripture. It will read it to you. Literally in your car, you pick the version, and depending on the version, change the accent of the person that reads it is lovely, okay? So go ahead and check it out. Quarter billion downloads, glory to God. Matthew 4, Matthew 4 is the first step of discipleship, and it's invitation. Jesus invites the disciples to put down their nets and follow him. And that's important to know because Putting down your nets and following Jesus means full surrender. When he said to, to, to the original disciples who were fishermen, they were identified in the text as fishermen, and he said, put down your net. In essence, he's saying, bring your whole self. Put down your identity. Put down even um, you know, what you've been confident in, your skill set. Give it all to me. Go all in. And so this is the first step of discipleship is understanding that God is not now an app on my phone to go with everything else. It's a full operating system surrender. I give up everything, and now God is part of every area of my life, full surrender to God. So Matthew 4, invitation. The second part is Matthew 5 through 7, which is information. Information. And This is the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters, where um, Jesus says, you've heard it said this, but I say this. You've heard it said this, but I say this. He helps them unlearn and relearn, unlearn and relearn. Blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the. So Jesus, really, we have one recorded full sermon of Jesus, and it's Matthew 5 through 7, all right? Information. And this is part of the life of every disciple. Uh, Many times um, people perish for the lack of knowledge. So we do have to grow in information, but discipleship is not information alone. If all you do is think discipleship is information, it doesn't make you a mature Christian. It makes you a smart Christian. And that's, that doesn't mean, make you mean you mature. It just means you know a bunch of stuff. And knowledge will puff up if you don't put it into practice. It would be like having a degree in exercise science and never exercising, expecting to be fit. It doesn't work like that. We, we have to actually put it into practice. So it's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. Invitation, information. And then Matthew 8 and 9 is what we call imitation. And this is where Jesus went from just inviting the disciples to follow him to now modeling behavior. And this is where Jesus now, he's into his community and Jesus now finds himself face to face with compassion fatigue. And I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show it to you. So now go to Matthew eight. If you got your Bible, go to Matthew eight. And I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna read a bunch of scripture, but I'm gonna go fast. I'm gonna ask you to follow me, okay? As I'm, as I'm going through this and just fasten your seatbelt. And as I'm reading this, I, I, this is all, it's a narrative, it's a story. So I want you to imagine as we're reading what Jesus did, I want you to like go ahead and make a movie in your mind. I want you to imagine this actually happening. And what I want you to, to remember is that Jesus was not only fully God, he was fully man. It's important we don't deify him to the point we forget about his humanity. And so he had human limitations, but watch Watch what Jesus does in Matthew 8 and 9, okay? Matthew 8 kicks off with a large crowd, people on the mountainside. A man with leprosy comes to Jesus, and and here's what he says. First guy, Matthew 8, Lord, the man said, if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. I have leprosy, would you help me be clean? So Jesus heals him. He goes on verse 3 and he heals him. Okay, as soon as that's done, in verse 5, And six, Matthew 8, 5, and 6, he moves on from the man with leprosy, and it says, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and in terrible pain. So he just healed a a, a man with leprosy, and now a Roman officer pleads with him, please, can you help me too? And and so uh, Jesus heals the man's servant. Verse 14, then Jesus arrived in Peter's house. Now now it's not people I don't know, it's somebody I do know, one of Jesus' closest friends. And Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever, but Jesus went over and, and, and touched her and her fever left. 
And so then she gets up and makes him some food. So now he's now, now he just healed her. And then as soon as he gets done with his meal, it says that evening in verse 16, that evening, many demon possessed people were brought to Jesus. Okay. From leprosy to somebody paralyzed to the fever to now a bunch of demon possessed people. And then he cast out all the demon, uh, evil spirits and then he healed all the sick. How many of you know? Deserves a day off. Verse 18, then Jesus saw a crowd, saw a crowd around him, and he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. <laughs> I love it. It just, you feel like Jesus would have been like, no, I've got boundless energy, bring them on. Jesus is like, man, I've just been with a bunch of demon possessed people. He's like, can we go to the other side of the lake? Paddle fast, don't look back, pretend like you didn't see him. Pretend like, he literally ducks out. He ducks out on this crowd. I know it seems not very Jesus like, but he does. He dips out on the crowd. He goes to the other side of the lake. When he gets to the other side of the lake, there's a guy there and he's like, Jesus, I want to hang out with you, man. Your life seems so awesome. And Jesus replies to the man, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests. The son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. It's not as glamorous as you think, dude. There, there's a lot of energy coming out of me. So then he goes back across the lake. Okay, so he's going back. And as he's going back, a fierce storm struck the lake and the waves are breaking into the boat. Verse 24, but Jesus was sleeping because he's so emotionally fatigued, he's, he's compassion exhausted, he's sleeping in a storm, but the disciples woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're gonna drown. I got another problem for you to solve. So he called him to win in the wave. It's a famous story because Jesus goes, oh, ye of little faith. And, and people think, that, you know, He's like scolding them because, you know, whatever. I think Jesus is like, why don't you solve your own problem? You know, can you have a little faith? Can I just sleep? I just, you know, did you see all the demon-possessed people? I just helped. All, you know, did you see that? All right, okay. Okay, so he gets to the other side of the lake. When he arrived, watch this, verse 28. This is all happening in, like, follow this linear path. He arrives at the other side of the lake in, in the region of God, blah, 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 blah. and two men who were possessed by demons met him. He can't get away from demon-possessed people. And then watch this. They came out of tombs and were so violent that no one could go through the area, and they began screaming at Jesus. He's thinking, well, at least the last group of demon-possessed people were kind of nice. <laughs> These guys are violent, and now they start screaming at Jesus. So he casts the demons out of them, casts into a bunch of pigs that kill themselves, and then everybody runs them out of town. Here we go, chapter nine, more of the same. Jesus climbs into a boat, goes back across the lake to his own town. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go home where people know me. I'm going to try to find my safe place. And some people brought a paralyzed man on a mat. And then this is where Jesus heals the paralytic man who's on the mat. Then after he heals the paralytic man on the mat, he starts walking, and it says Jesus was walking along, and he sees a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. He's like, hey, man, follow me. Be my disciple. I need some help. You may be a tax collector. I know you're a little bit shady. I don't even care at this point. I have compassion fatigue, all right? I'm tired of hanging out with demon-possessed. I just had two violent demon-possessed guys. I had a bunch of pigs. I need a few hands, okay? And so he, he gets Matthew with him. And, and then when the Pharisees saw this, that he's hanging, hanging out with Matthew, he says, oh, who's your teacher to eat with such scum? So now he's got to defend himself for hanging out with Matthew because now they're attacking Matthew. Okay, compassion fatigue. One day, the disciples from John the Baptist, so now here comes some friendly fire. Uh, the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why don't, why don't your disciples fast like we do and the Pharisees do? Why, how come your disciples, I don't know if they said it like that, but that's how I heard it when I read it. It's like, how come your, how come your disciples, how come your disciples don't? don't fast like we do because we fast all the time and you guys don't even fast. I mean, maybe you cast out some demons and stuff and maybe you walk on water or whatever, but you know, it's like, you don't even fast. Like who are you? Do you even fast, bro? Like you don't even fast. Like you, what, you don't even, what kind of, what kind of Messiah do you think you are? Like you don't even. And so then Jesus had to like kind of defend himself and his disciples to them and has this conversation. Then verse 18 and, and, and uh, then Jesus, as he was saying this, a leader of the synagogue Okay, so as he's saying this, as he's talking to them about why and he and his disciples don't fast as much as they do, a leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. He said, can you bring her back to life again? Jesus is like, yes. So he gets up to go bring 
the man's daughter back to life. And as he's going to do that, just then, verse 20, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. And when she touched him, something came out of him and, and she was healed. So here's another one. Then he goes back to heal the original girl who had died. And he goes and says, you know, she's just asleep and raises her. And then it says in verse 27, after Jesus left the girl's home, so he just raised her from the dead and healed the woman with the issue of blood, two blind men following behind shouting, son of David, have mercy on us. And they went right into the house where he was staying. Didn't knock, didn't ring the doorbell, didn't ask if it was a good time, just came in the house. And Jesus heals them. When they left, a demon-possessed man who couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. Are you feeling the compassion fatigue? Any of you like, man, I'm really glad I'm not Jesus. <laughs> you <know? laughs> You're like, Jesus, good luck being you, dude. That was, was a lot of work to be Jesus, okay? Um, it, it says they bring a demon-possessed man who couldn't speak. And he's probably thinking, well, at least this one can't talk. And he gets to verse 33. It says, so Jesus cast out the demon, and the man began to speak, and the crowds were amazed. And they say, nothing like this has ever happened in Israel. But the Pharisees said, well, <laughs> he can cast out demons because he's empowered by the prince of demons. Yeah, that makes sense. So Jesus had done nothing but give, 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 give. And all they can say is, yeah, he's, he probably cast a demon out because he answers to the prince of demons. Verse 35. Jesus then traveled through all the towns, all the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when, the, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now watch this, verse 37. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great. By great, he didn't mean pleasant. He meant massive, like boiling the ocean. The harvest is great. The workers are few. So pray, like if you're going to pray, pray for this, that the Lord who is in charge of the harvest, ask him to send more workers into his fields. I want you to understand the paradigm that Jesus is laying down here because let's say it again. Don't deify him to the point you forget about his humanity. Even Jesus realized, I can't keep this pace up. It says at the end of chapter 9, he still had compassion. If he kept that pace up much longer, he was about to have some compassion fatigue. Jesus knew he couldn't go from lame man to demon-possessed person to dead person to, to I, I just can't keep doing this. I can't do it all. I'm limited. So he said, here's the deal, guys. Here's how we are going to overcome to where any of us get compassion fatigue. We've got to do this together. He said, pray that the Lord will raise up workers for his field. That's the end of chapter 9. That, that, that's literally the last word. Fields is the last word of chapter 9. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is now the fourth eye of discipleship, which is innovation. And watch this. Chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Now, this is where this verse makes all the sense in the world within its context, knowing that Jesus just went on this barrage of miracles that were taking him beyond his physical limits. And he said, guys, the only way this is going to work is if I now give you the authority, if I now give you the power to go do the things that you have seen me do. And then it says in verse 5, then Jesus sent out the 12 disciples. He sent them out. So friends, I want you to think about the list I mentioned earlier. You don't need to remember the specifics, but remember the size. 
the greatness of the harvest. And I want you to think about how we, as believers, together are the body of Christ. Now, here's the mistake we don't want to make. I don't want you to develop a God complex yourself to think you're like Jesus and now you're going to go do everything Jesus did by yourself. And you become pathologically responsible. And everything you see, you feel responsible for absolutely everything and run yourself ragged. When Jesus was saying, you're going to do greater works than I've done and you're, you're going to do more than I've done, he wasn't saying that you yourself are going to one-up Jesus. He's saying we as the body of Christ. He got the 12 disciples together, and then that group grew from there. Then you get into the book of Acts, and it spread like wildfire, to which we're a downline now. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, which means we've been invited into this. We work together. And the two extreme ends is, is, is one extreme end, are people that just give, 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 and they live their entire lives like Jesus in Matthew 8 and 9 at an unsustainable pace of giving to everyone. They don't tell anyone no. Yes, 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 just yes to everything and run around and, and, and every time a friend needs something, you got to give it to the friend and your sister needs it and, you, and your brother needs it and your brother's friend and your brother's sister's brother's friend's cousin's second twin twice removed the third time and I got to go help them because I can't tell anyone no. And so you run around, run around trying to do it all. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end, the other end of the spectrum is the person that doesn't give to anybody they don't know or they don't give to anything they don't personally reap. You know, Jesus actually in Matthew 5 says, he said, hey, if you only love people who love you, what big deal is that? He said, even heathens do that. Even tax collectors do that. He said, that's not impressive. You only love the people who love you. You only do good to the people that do good to you. So when we look at Jesus, we see he... He healed somebody. He actually, the, the, the Roman centurion, when he healed the Roman centurion's servant, he didn't even know the servant's name. He never went to the house. He just sent somebody a long way off. He's, he, he's healed. Go home, he's healed. See, Jesus, it wasn't just people that would give back to him. In fact, you'll see there are some times the guy wanted to follow Jesus. He said, no, you don't need to follow me. Go home. So There are some people that give to everybody all the time, and then there are some that don't give to anybody at all. And then there are some of us in the middle. Here's what we have to understand. You don't have to do everything. Don't try to do it all. Don't even try to do it all. Just do your part. Just do your part. What is God asking you to do now? And then we as a church work together to touch the ends of the earth. I got to tell you, I'll go back to my earlier story. I came away from the thing. I went from sad to mad to demoralized because I felt like I wasn't doing enough. And I came away and I said, you know what? I I, I can't go run to every cause. I can't go to the ends of the earth all the time. But here's what I can do. Here's what I can do. I can do something to help somebody who is doing it. Well, you have to understand within our church, like you come to one church, part of our job as a church and what we do even organizationally is help as a body collectively to work with people doing things around the world that you may or may not even know of. Let, let, let me just tell you about a few of them real quick. We, we support a missionary in, in Africa. She's from the United States. She was actually a nurse practitioner, felt called to Africa, goes to Africa, retrofits an ice cream truck as a cervical screening station. So she's providing health care in villages in Africa in a, in a retrofitted ice cream truck to people that would not have it otherwise. 
Every time I hear her talk, I'm ready to go and, and be by her side. But this is, God's called me here to do this, what I'm doing. But what am I doing? I'm giving some of myself. I'm giving some of my time, energy, and money to help her do what she needs to do. Um, I'll give you another one. We, we just saw the hurricane hit Louisiana, right? And, and you're watching and you're going, oh, I want to do something. I feel pathologically responsible. I want, I, want, I want to help. How do I help? Well, we support Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope is there right now. They're first responders, boots on the ground, and they're going to stay in the months to rebuild. So when you give to our church, we take money. We literally take a portion of our, of our operational money, and we just give it proactively because we're not going to wait till a hurricane hits. We're giving a convoy because they're reaching out their first responders. I, I, I can't go to Louisiana right now. I've got responsibility here, but I can help in what they're doing on the other side of the world. Um, I, I see issue with orphans. I, I want, you know, we have in South America, we have the Doubt family that are serving. They're helping to feed, educate, and, and, and train up young orphans in South America. I, I, I mean, in our own city, Compassion's Way, we help support Compassion's Way financially. We, we give to them. And two weeks ago, Compassion's Way gave away 650 meals on our streets in Whitehall. Um, last week, gave over a thousand boxes of produce to folks. Okay. So, the reason I'm telling you this is a couple of things. One, I want to give you the information. I want you to know that when you give, that is part of our mission. That's a big part of our mission that I understand that you can't run around and vet everybody out. We literally do that so that we find out who's people doing the best things. We have 20 partners globally and locally that are doing great stuff. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to get behind them. And we're not going to feel bad that we're not doing enough because they're doing, we're, get, we're part of their mission. Jesus said, you guys, hey, 12 of you, Come together. I, I can't do this in my own humanity. We, we, we do this together. So I encourage you right now. Take, take, take an inventory, okay? Look at how are you giving to God? How are you giving to your circle? How are you giving to your community? Time, energy, money. And ask God, Lord, just... Sign up. Do I keep going or do you want me to change something? Do I need to pull something back, add something over here? And whatever God's telling you to do, I want to challenge you to do it. I want to end with this. If you're looking for something to do and you say, you know what, I, I, want, to, I want to give to my community, to somebody I may never meet. In season three, so the last four months of our year, we're going to be working uh, both in the fall and around Christmas with the foster care system. Uh, in the fall, we're going to be working with our county's foster care system. And at Christmas, we're going to work with the whole state's foster care system, children's services. We, we've developed a great relationship, amazing people. They're so great. And we asked them, hey, what do you guys need? And they said uh, one, of, one of the issues that they have is that often families are limited by the number of children that they can bring in based on limited space. And so one of the ways, they, they said one of the ways that we can actually help, because there are families that want to adopt but they don't have the space, is that one of the things you can do is, is actually get a bunk bed for a family. And so we've committed as a church by faith that we want to help build 30 bunk beds for our, our county foster care system help families be able to bring in more kids. So here's what we're gonna do. There's two ways you can get involved if you want to. The first one is you can work the cause. You can actually show up and help. October 10th, and you can write that down or you can see it, we'll, we'll put it all over our communications. October 10th in the, in the Gahanna parking lot, um, we're gonna be building bunk beds and we're gonna do three two-hour shifts. We need 30 volunteers for each shift. So my math's not super great. Is that 60? 90? Thanks, dude. It's, I got, yeah, it's, I'll talk, I'll tell you about it later. Um, 90, I was totally testing him. Um, 90, and right now, if you go to our website, one.church, uh, the link is live. So you can go and sign up to, to go and serve there. The second thing you can do is fund the cause. And if you go to our website, one.church slash give, um, there's a drop down that will come up that will just, it'll uh, say foster outreach, and you can give to that. 
$380 will fully outfit an entire bunk bed. Two, the bed itself, two mattresses, two comforters, and two sets of linens. Maybe we have connect group that says, you know, we'll, we'll pool our money together and we'll, we'll buy one. Maybe there's a family that say, you know what, we're going to buy one for uh, 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 another family. Maybe there are some of you who could do more than one. I don't know. But I just think that it, this would be pretty cool. I think it would be pretty cool as a church if we made a statement to not only our foster care system, but to foster kids and foster families to be able to help them have a good place to sleep. And so this is uh, one option. But don't feel like you have to do that. Maybe God's leading you to do something else and he's telling you to say no to this so you can say yes to something else. So let's take a moment here and let's pray and let's allow God to speak to us even now.